And our precious Heavenly Father, how privileged we are to gather together again in this, your place that you have provided, wherein Jesus Christ might be lifted up and praised and honored and glorified. Thank you, Lord, for a place of worship, a place of teaching, a place of prayer, a place of fellowship, a place, our Father, in which your people Those who have received the Lord Jesus as Savior can fellowship uh, in liberty, in freedom, without being molested or threatened in any way, shape, or form to carry on in peace the joy of the Lord and our gratitude to you for all of your goodness to us. Our Father, we cannot thank you enough for the way that you have designed life to be not only our own personal lives as you order us day by day, as you allow certain experiences to invade our lives, as you lead us into new experiences of challenge, as you indeed fortify us for all that is to come and prepare us for the days ahead. But we thank you, our Father, that you constantly are a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. We thank you, Father, that you have exhorted us to pray because you love to have fellowship with us. You talk to us as much as we talk to you as we pray. We sense within our own hearts and our own lives as we pour out our needs, our concerns, the burdens of our soul. And you, in these times together, just bring that sweetness of peace, of serenity to settle in upon our souls. And and as we get up off our knees or in the place where we have been sitting or praying, we would sense that it's going to be all right. You are with us. You have spoken to us. You have assured us of your presence, your watch care. And we thank you, Father, that you fulfill these requests in your own way and in your own time. And our Father, we are tremendously encouraged by this people who pray faithfully, and we thank you for the answers. Our Father, in our presence this morning, is Barry and say you. We thank you for the wonderful way that you have undertaken for her surgery We thank you, Father, for this measure of recuperation that she is able to be with us. We thank you for her growth and strength and in her desire to keep on serving you in all the days that lie ahead. We pray your blessing upon her in all of her aspirations, that you would free her from pain or discomfort. You would restore her completely to full measure of usefulness for you. And then bless her family. We thank you, Father, that every life that becomes the object of prayer and the person to whom we would ask for your blessing to fall upon, that that life, our Father, becomes the message to those who are nearest and dearest to us in family circles. And so, our God, we pray your blessing upon everyone spread far and wide in this precious family that they all may come to know Jesus as Savior, grow in him, and serve him faithfully. We thank you, our Father, that we can remember those who have lost loved ones in recent days. And we pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit that uh, is not easily explained, but it is certainly experienced when we face these times of loss, these times, our Father, in which We know how important it is for people to trust Christ, that they would leave this world and they would go to a heavenly home where we will be forever. And that there is great hope and anxious spirit as we think of being reunited with those who have believed and gone on before us, who have preceded us in the life of faith. And we will be together again to rejoice and to serve and to work and to praise you forever. Our Father, we pray that you would continue to undertake for those who have suffered loss. We think of Steve Harris 
Thank you for his fellowship with us from time to time and for his faithfulness in our seniors' meeting. And we think of the home going of his mother just day before yesterday, and we pray that you would comfort him and his sister, family, and friends as they would uh, plan, as they would look forward to a service in the days to come. We pray, Father, that you would indeed strengthen him and give him that wonderful assurance that as his dad who preceded his mom into your presence as a singer, as a servant of yours in worship service and gatherings of your people, that this dear woman who had a different ministry, a ministry in a nursing home and ministry of day by day, just being a faithful believer and allowing you to shine through her in your own way, never to complain, but always our Father to praise you. Thank you for those that we continue to remember, and we do commit everyone on our prayer list to you. Uh, we think of those who have faced surgery in recent days, and we pray that you would bless them. We ask that you would undertake for Shauna, as she anticipates surgery, that you would bless her and restore her to physical health and strength to carry on her ministry that you have called her to accomplish. We thank you, Father, for uh, each one of these lives uh, and their families. We think of Sammy as we continually lift her before you, that she may know your touch upon her for good. We pray for the family at large as they face other concerns and pray that you would indeed work to glorify yourself in each one of their lives. And so, our Father, we could go on and mention life after life after life. We pray particularly for those who have just recently undergone surgery, that you would sustain them, you would bless them, and be with them that they would know healing and health and blessing from you. And so, our God, it is a wonderful thing because we care, because we are interested in your very best to be the portion of each one. And we think of the lives bowed together with us this morning, and you know the burdens that we carry. You know the concerns that we have for those who are very near and dear to us, and yet they have not yet trusted Christ as Savior. And so we pray and we live and we reach out to them in love and concern and in practical ways and we communicate your concern and we believe as we pray faithfully that these lives will come in your time to know Jesus as Savior. No good thing will you withhold from them that walk uprightly and this would be a good thing to see people come to know Jesus. Bless us Lord as we continue our worship today Bless our nation. We continue to remember those in Alberta who are putting their lives back together, rebuilding homes, rebuilding families. Lord, be their strength, be their stay, be their supply, and may they learn, our Father, the great lesson that the things which are to endure time are forever. Those qualities which are found in Scripture Salvation in Christ, service for you, being loyal and being helpful and telling others of the Lord Jesus that really what happened in the great fires that swept through their territory and robbed them of all their worldly goods will happen to us all in days to come. Physical things will not survive. Only that which we do for you will last for eternity. So Lord, bless us to live in light of your teaching and our love for the Lord and our home in heaven. For Jesus' sake, amen.
Well, how are you doing anyway? <laughs> That's a common expression, isn't it? You know, and I thought about that as it's offered uh, uh, by you truly and uh, others on various occasions as you meet people. And really, it's kind of a, a greeting, isn't it? You know, good day, good morning, uh, good afternoon, whatever. And it's a personal kind of sir. We are concerned, uh, you and how you are doing and what is happening in your life. And uh, we're asking, really, just are you on uh, the victory side? Are you on top of the circumstances rather than under the circumstances? And that's a common expression that is used in our relationships one with another. But actually, it's a familiar one, and it's a, an expression that is as old as people because we are all concerned about people no matter who they are, where they are, and whether they are doing what they could do and being what they, God would have them to be. And so when we come to this uh, chapter uh, 3 in Second Corinthians, uh, we find that the Apostle Paul is really mirroring his own heart and his own life and his own struggles. And uh, I, I do not know of a time when I have studied uh, the Word of God, and this came through to me so powerfully out of this book. There is no other portion of Scripture that unveils the thinking of the Apostle Paul as he wrestled with the problems and difficulties that he was faced with. He was the chief apostle. He was second unto Christ, really, to carry the gospel, and yet he was so unworthy because he was the enemy of the church. He killed Christians. He beat them. He put them in jail. Uh, and then he was wonderfully converted. God took him away as a Jew who was already schooled in the Old Testament and schooled him in the truth of the word of God under grace and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that schooling, he then had a fire in his heart to say, we've got to plant churches. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I must carry that out. And he did that. He did that with a, a, a passion of heart and soul. No matter what it cost him personally, he was on the job for the Lord. And so when we read 1 Corinthians, we read of a church that was established and as it was established, it was grounded. He spent 18 months getting it going. He got some other people to come in, and he was concerned not just for Corinth, but he was concerned for the whole world. And he was saying, where would I go next to start another church and get some people in there and go here and go there, and so on, to see that the gospel is made available to people where they live. Any little town, village, city, we want to reach them for Christ. And so, as he established this Corinthian church, it wasn't long before, and churches uh, without some regular uh, oversight of good people who really know the word of God, who are experienced and sensitive to the problems, the church got into problems. And it slipped off. Uh, off the well-worn path of faith and got themselves in difficulty and finally they said, we need help, we need help. And they wrote a letter to the Apostle Paul and they said, we've got some problems and they put them down, one, two, three, four, and will you help us? What do we do? How do we solve these problems? And that's what First Corinthians is all about. And we went through those uh, chapters and we saw how God we led the Apostle Paul to deal. I and mean, it's like a lawyer, you know. You have a problem and you go to a lawyer and you say, now look, I, I, I've got this problem and what do you suggest that I do? I want to be on the right side of the law. I want to do the good thing. I want to be helpful. And I want to be able to uh, certainly encourage and bless God's people. And so the Apostle Paul is uh, sort of uh, professional in that First Corinthians. He, he, he lays it right out on the line, problem after problem, this is what you do, this is how you do it, da-da-da-da-da-da. But then when he sent the letter to the people and they heard the, <laughs> the solutions, and especially with regard to that man, 
who was uh, living with his father's wife, not his mother. His mother, I think, had died, and his father had married another younger woman, and the son got involved with this younger woman, and it was an immoral relationship, and they were involved as members of the church. And, and they wrote to him, and he said, look, you need to discipline. You cannot have a little bit of leaven coming in because it'll just corrupt the whole of the church. It won't stand for truth anymore. So you've got to clean this up. And he, he was really very to the point, loving, but firm and uh, disciplinary in his action. But, you know, that ruffled some feathers. Number one, you know, I don't think it's good when people say, you made a bad mistake, and, uh, and you need to correct this. Well, you know, you are vulnerable. They are finding fault with you and your judgment and so on. And as a result, there were people who were offended at Paul. And I don't know that we, uh, we, we did what we do. Uh, they were self-defensive, of course. Uh, I, I think we were doing what we should do and so on, and we tried and, and whatnot. And Paul, and, and they sort of build up a bit of resentment toward Paul. And they said, you know, we don't all agree with you, Paul. And Paul got that in the reply letters and in the people who visited him. You know, all's not well in Corinth with you, Paul. In fact, they're looking around for other people to come in and preach rather than you. And so on. And who could be a better preacher than the Apostle Paul? And so on. So the whole point being that they had problems in the early church. Don't ever believe that when the early church started, it was a perfect church and everything was wonderful and great and Fine, and we have problems today. No, the church has always had problems, but we always have ways to deal with those problems. So when he writes Second Corinthians, he comes up with, uh, well, things like uh, in second uh, chapter of uh, Second Corinthians in verse 1, you know, he writes this, but I determined this myself that I would not come again to you in heaviness, what is he saying? He said, you're already upset with me. If I come, it's only going to stir the pot and you're going to be really angry and you're going to be upset. I don't want to bring uh, any kind of division. I don't want to bring any bad spirit. I don't want to encourage you to do the wrong thing. And, and besides, I've got a lot of other work to do outside. And they said, well, let's make a date. Let's have you come and so on. And he wouldn't even settle on a date. He said, well, I, I don't know how to plan my calendar because there are needs all over the place and I want to invest my time and effort where it's going to count the most. Logical decision. So actually, as he, as he really speaks, you see he is really struggling here and they don't really understand that the truth is all important to Paul. If you forsake the truth, you get into error, and you lose the whole of the testimony of God. So he writes unto them, and he said, you know, and then he hits them in a, in a very vulnerable spot, because in the second chapter of Second Corinthians, he brings up this issue of uh, the, the son who was living with uh, his father's wife. And he said, you know, uh, you didn't handle that very well. Understand something. Discipline is not to just come down with the, uh, with the hammer on somebody and mash them into the ground and, and walk away from them in defeat. Discipline is to correct them, to restore them, to bring them back into fellowship with God and to become productive for him again. And after all, think of your own salvation. Didn't God do that? He looked upon. Christ died for us when? When were we were yet sinners. We didn't deserve to have Christ come and bring us salvation. He did it anyway. Why? He loved us. He wanted our lives to be productive for him. And so he says, you know, every once in a while, Christians get off the track. And when they get off the track, they're a bad testimony. And people are very quick. They don't go to your church, but they'll say, hey, you know that fellow is running around and doing all kinds of bad things here? And yet he goes to that church. Now, who wants to belong to a church like that? You know, you hear one thing in the service and you do another thing in your daily life. So the Apostle Paul nails them with truth. And he said, listen, do you know that I have word that this fellow, when you brought discipline upon him, he fell apart. 
He wept, he cried in repentance, and he said, it's a terrible thing I've done. Please, God, forgive me. And you wouldn't forgive him. And you wouldn't say, well, look, if you confess your sin, isn't that what 1 John 1, 9 says? If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Nobody lives a perfect life. It's not licensed to go out and sin any time you want. But if you fall because of uh, lack of learning, inexperience, whatever it may be, you can come to God and God says, uh, look, Heavenly Father, I, I really messed up and I'm really sorry and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And as a redeemed child of God who trusted Christ, Jesus has already paid the bill for that when he died on the cross and shed his blood. And God says, you have confessed in all honesty. You don't want to go back to that life again. And I restore you. And what did you do? You didn't listen. You didn't restore that person. And as a result, they are, they are, they're at the place, well, they're so beaten down. He said that they have, uh, well, they, it's, it's going to overcome. These circumstances are going to overcome. Who knows? Maybe the guy will go out and say, they don't listen to me. They don't love me anymore. I'll just hang myself and die. Now, is that what? And he nails them there. Well, that adds, you know, some, some fire to the, the, the people who are not all together with Paul. So as he talks here, he really is talking about we need to be open and honest, and we are not. People who go and judge other people, hammer them down and so on. Number one, anybody that's anxious to punish people and make them of no worth and no value after they've stumbled and fallen, I question their own heart. Do you have a heart to see people really saved, to see them get up out of the mire of sin and to build a, a, a right kind of life? And so what does he say in verse 10 of uh, chapter 3? He said, to whom... Notice, you forgive anything. I forgive also, for if I forgave anything to whom I forgave for your sakes, forgive I it in the person of Christ. One, two, three, four, five times he mentions forgiveness. You are people who are great on judgment. You didn't do anything before. You just let them run wild. And then when you're called to task about it, you really came down hard and you nailed him and you put him down and he's ready. He, he's just beaten. He has no, no get up and go, no hope, no nothing. Forgive him. Restore him. Get somebody to disciple him. Get him back in and, and uh, get him to, into a constructive lifestyle here. So the Apostle Paul really, and, and it's, it is exactly true, you know, where we preach the truth that often people are the hardest on people when they repent and they come, yeah, but we know what your life was like before. And no, we, we, you can sit maybe in the back of the, uh, of the auditorium or something. We don't want you to be up front. We don't want you to come with your reputation. Look, does God forgive all sin? When we trust Christ as Savior, absolutely. Now, we need to prove our faith and we need to establish our, our faith with works. We need to do the right thing and restore and, and get back. But we certainly are people who forgive. If we are not willing to forgive, God will not forgive us. We know that. So anyway, as the Apostle Paul talks here, he really is sharing now his feelings. And I know you're upset with me, but look, you know, you aren't doing everything right either. And you've got this pro problem with this fellow who needs forgiveness. He needs to be restored. He needs to be brought back into a contributory position in the family of God. So he writes here in the, in the third chapter, he said, you know, I sometimes am, am puzzled what we can do to establish people as worthwhile people. What can we do? Uh, do we write letters in their favor? Well, we can do that. Letters of recommendation or whatever. He begins in verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? You know, do I go out and say, look, I'm a reliable 
faithful Christian worker, and therefore you need to be a friend to me, you need to help me, you need to uh, uh, assist me in any way. I need a job, I need work, I need a place to live, or whatever it may be. Epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation. Would that do it? Ye, and then he says, here's the truth. Do you know what really convinces people? The best letters in the world are the letters of lives that have been changed. Once I was a blasphemer. Once I lived an immoral life. Once I was in drugs. Once I was in alcoholism. Once I was a sexual abuser or whatever it may be. But you know, Christ came into my life and he changed me and I'm born again. I'm not perfect. I battle every day. But he is the one who is my strength and my enablement. And he said, really, as I think about this, you people are the greatest authorities with regard to the gospel that is preached unto you by me or anyone else who preaches the gospel. You are the letters. The changed lives speak for themselves. People can say what they want about your past, but God says, you know, the past, why, it's buried in the deepest sea. It's separated as far as the east is from the west. Your sins and iniquities I will remember no more when you have trusted Christ as Savior. You're free. You're clear. You're empowered with the Holy Spirit to do right. And we are here to help you. So uh, he talks here about how we are to support one another, how we are to help one another. And the Apostle Paul lets all the bars down and he says, this is really comes from my heart. This is how I really feel about this. And I'm not being, you know, just playing the role of saying certain things and not getting out of line. So as he talks to these people, he says, you are proof positive that Christ is the changer, the life changer. And you make people pr productive and positive and so on. And this is the great ministry that we have to proclaim to a lost and a dying world today. Honestly, this is what the world needs. They don't think right. Uh, our government is not passing laws that are really encouraging anything that is biblical by way of the teaching and the molding and shaping of young lives or teenagers or how they should behave in society, how they should handle this, that, and the other thing. They are, they are just undermining everything we stand for. And we need to be there with the truth. And we constantly share the truth. The word of God always obtains its objective. We share the gospel. The gospel still works today. Not maybe at the time we wanted to, but it does. We sow the seed. The seed is watered by someone else. And down the road we hear... You know, so-and-so, oh yeah, I remember, I talked to him, gave him a track. Guess what? He trusted Christ the other day as we were in a meeting and so on. Well, the, it, this is what it's all about. We really need to be doing the things that God has for us to do. And then he brings in this whole thing. He said about Moses, and this goes back to Exodus 34. And you remember in the history of Israel, they're on the, on the journey to the promised land and, and, and they're coming out of uh, lawless, godless Egypt with all of its uh, abuse and so on, slave labor, and they're liberated now and now they're on their way to their own homeland. And uh, in their journey, God says, Moses, you're getting the people together here and so on. You're going to go to your own land. You're going to need some things to live by. And so I want you to come up to the mountain, Mount Sinai, and I'm going to give you a tablet. I'm going to give you some laws to govern your people. And these are the laws that will govern my nation one day when my son rules and reigns, when he sets up his kingdom upon earth. And that's still future for us. And so what happens? Well, he talks about this here. He says our, our, uh, in verse 7, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. Now, what's he talking about? Well, when Moses goes up to the mountain, what did God give him? He gave him tablets 
in stone, and they were written, the scriptures say, by the finger of God. And so we have the Ten Commandments, and we have additional uh, guidelines and direction for their lifestyle, and that all was to come, and that makes up our Old Testament, the Torah, the law of God, and so on. And when Moses went up there for more than a month, and I'll tell you, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And what happened to people? God, they said, boy, we've been, you know, we need a party. We, we've been really hacking this journey business pretty hard, and we need to relax and let it all hang out. And boy, they had a, uh, an orgy and a, a carrying on and so on and so on. And when Moses came down and saw what they did, he became so angry. Here he is trying to get the laws from God to give to the people so they will be blessed of God and used of God as a light to a dark world that doesn't know which side is up. So what can we do? And these people go off the deep end. They sin in ways that pagan people would never even think of sinning. And here they are in their nakedness and their drunkenness and carrying on. And he saw this, and oh, and he, he, he lost it. Moses lost his temper, and he was the meekest man that ever lived. I mean, it took a lot to get him worked up where he'd smash the tablets of stone, and he had to go back and get a, a reprint. And, and he did that, and, and so on. But the point being that Moses was so moved by just this short time away, and what happens to the people of God, boy? They don't have somebody to keep them in line, and boy, they go off the deep end, and it was terrible. A disgrace, a disgrace. Well, anyway, when he comes back, and he has his second copy here in verse 7 of chapter 3, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stone was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Now, when Moses was spent, you know, over a month with God on the mountain and God's talking to him constantly and he, he's reading his writings of, with the finger of God and so on and so on, Moses is absolutely caught away with the glory of truth. Because when God gave the Ten Commandments and the law of God, he's saying, I'm giving you what's right and what's wrong. And you will never have an adequate code of right and wrong by any government under the sun because man is bent to sin, to please himself. He's selfish. He's out for anything he can get. And so he says, this is the right way to live. These are the things that you have to do. And when he came down with this, this was the law, he was going to present this to the people. This is the way God wants us to live. We are the people of God. So as Moses uh, responds and coming down, he was unconscious of it. But being in the presence of God, it was like looking at the sun at noonday. People could look at it. His face just radiated the bright and the light and the brilliance of the presence of God. So what happened? He sensed this, and he put a veil over his face so he could communicate with the people so they wouldn't be blinded by his countenance. And as, as uh, this was carried out, uh, the point was made, well, why was the veil put upon Moses' face? Well, we find that with time, the brilliance, the radiance of his countenance was reduced and he became a normal person. It faded away. And the reason that they put the veil on his face was to hide the fact that this fades away. This is reduced, and you go back to normal countenance, normal communication without all of this extraordinary sense of God's presence in your midst so that the glory will be of God and his presence. And when we get into the presence of God and we listen to God and we do what God wants us to do and we know what's right and what's wrong and we enforce this, we're in our sphere of influence. God blesses and God brings great favor upon his people. 
So the point that was being made here was that it wasn't to hide the brilliance of his countenance, but it was to say what? He came down with truth. And where do we find truth today? Only from the word of God, the law of God. We can't believe people anymore. They say one thing, they win the campaign and are elected to office and they do the opposite. You can't depend on anything and things are changing and back and forth and who knows what and so on. But when, you know, when God gives us something, it's absolute truth, it's unchangeable. Truth is always unchangeable. It's not a seasonal thing. It doesn't come in and go out with style or whatever it may be. So that when the, the uh, case of Moses was here, he was really saying, this is what's right and wrong from the hand of God, and we are to keep these commandments. We are to do what God wants us to do. Now that was all part of instruction on God's part for people, because we know that within ourselves we cannot keep the law of God without God's help. You'll never keep the law of God if you want to have parties and orgies and drunkenness and carousing and all of this kind of thing. You'll never realize that, but that's the nature of people. People will act that way and then say, well, we ought to give attention to the law of God. And the upshot of all of this is that Moses was saying, we find out that we can't keep the law of God. And what do we need? We need something in addition. And that paved the way for the coming of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because when Jesus came, he paid the price for our sin. They were schooled in how to handle their sin with the sacrificial system of animals and the shedding of blood against the day when Jesus would come and the prophet of old, bold out of the wilderness, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. All those sacrifices, those lambs, those rams that were offered in Jewish services of sacrifice and shedding of blood, here is the fulfillment. With the coming of Jesus, he is the savior of the world. He will die. He will pay for the price. And all of those things pointed to him. When he dies, when he pays the price, it's finished, it's done forever, never to be done again. And Moses is trying to present this to the people of God. You will find out that you are not able to keep the law of God. Now, and you will fail over and over again just by sheer determination, I'm going to do all of these things. But you'll slip up sooner or later, and then what? You have no coverage. But the only way you can do that is by, and this is the case for Christ coming, the birth of the church, the ministry of the gospel. It's not through us, it's through our faith and trust in Christ. Christ is the source of our strength. Christ is the one who is going to help us and aid us in our endeavor to keep the law of God. So it comes down to, and there is an awful lot more that could be, that could be said, but it comes down to these points of concern with regard to doing the will of God. The word of God is always truth. We are accountable to do it. And the only way we'll do it is by Christ, salvation, a new birth in Christ, and the Spirit of God living within us to enable us to be the kind of people that he wants us to be. This is the answer. It's Christ, it's Christ, it's Christ. And the Jews still stumble over that issue. They're still looking for the Messiah. He's already come, and he's going to come again as king. And as he talks to us of the uh, enablement, why do we need Christ and faith in him to keep what God has given unto us by way of Old Testament law, by way of New Testament principle for the behavior of the church? Why? 
because it is from God. It is truth, it's unchangeable, and it needs to be honored. And so we find that we only find the enablement in Christ himself. And you need to be thinking not of yourself and not of you know, your organization or not of making a good show or whatever it may be. It's pleasing God because you love him, because you care for him, because you desire to do his will. Because only God is sufficient to help his people to do and to be what he wants them to be. You'll never do it with your own effort. You will fail. And this becomes evident, and it's interesting, in the book of Second Corinthians, how he speaks of this great truth. The truth is sufficiency. Who is sufficient to do this? Who can keep the Ten Commandments? That's a basis of witnessing or a basis of witnessing to people. Uh, you know, God loves you, and God has provided a way that you can come into fellowship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, who loved you, died on the cross, shed his blood, went into the grave, and rose again the third day to save you. This is all given by God. Why? Because he wants you to have his sufficiency. So let me just point you to three passages here in Second Corinthians. And in Second Corinthians chapter 3, the, ver the chapter we're in, and verse 5, what do we find and what do we read? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. You can't do it on your own. You can try, but you'll fail. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. We think in, to think anything as of ourselves, that we did it. But our sufficiency is of God. That's right. The only way we can do it is with God's help. And to have God's help, you do what God wants you to do. You worship him. You, you read his word each day. You talk with him in prayer. You honor his house. You come together with his people and so on. He's talking about sufficiency. And uh, the apostle Paul here now is stepping over and saying, the issue with the man who is living in a moral life and you thought you were coming in and you're going to straighten everything out in your own strength. No, no, you know, it's Christ and it's his sufficiency. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's going to get it done. Notice in 2 Timothy or Second Corinthians and chapter uh, 9, we also have a word with regard to sufficiency. And that's what we need. We need enough. We need plenty. We need an overflow of God's provision that we'll be able to do what he wants us to do, and that's keep his word, because his word is truth. Now listen to this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Put a circle around the alls in there. What a comprehensive verse that is. And God is able to make all grace. Grace is, we don't deserve it, we need it, and he gives it to us. It's free of charge. He gives us all grace when we do his will and believe in Christ. And we abound, we overflow in our good work and in keeping the law of God that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. So as a Christian, we have everything we need to live a godly life. When we receive Christ, it's all there. We have to grow and read. We have to ask and we have to pray. We have to live. We have to do. We have to obey. But everything is there for us. We can't say, you know, I, was, I, I just came up short. I didn't have a supply of this, and I couldn't do it, and it all washed away on me. No, no. All sufficiency in all things may abound. To abound is to overflow. You got more than you need. It spills over the top. It runs wild on you. To every good work. 
And the third passage in 2 Corinthians, and this is what Paul's trying to get across to these people. You know, you've got to live with God. You've got to walk with God. It's a personal relationship that empowers you to do what God has asked you to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and this is the last of the three verses that I'll share with you today. But 9 uh, and 10. Chapter 12, 9 and 10. Now listen to this. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And who hasn't come up and said, Now, Lord, I know what you want me to do, but I just can't do that. I don't have the, I, the wherewithal. I don't have the, the intelligence. I don't have the willpower. I don't have anything. What does he say? Look, come back. He said, as a believer, you have it. You just have to... Apply it and trust, and God will do it. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In fact, these are the people that I love to give my strength to, weak people. If you say, oh, I could do it, I am able to do anything. No, don't, you'll not get it. You need to be saying, Lord, I can't. And then I'll pour out everything that you need. My grace is made sufficient made perfect in weakness, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. That's hardship. That's suffering. That's pain. That's going through, you know, all the bad stuff because you're going to live a good life because that's what God wants you to do. You're going to put up with all kinds of hell in the workplace, maybe in the family, maybe in... uh, relationships with people, neighbors, or whoever's on your case, and people look for you, and they make you a target, and they make your life miserable. For when I am weak, then am I strong. We don't have a case for failure in the Christian life. Because if we have Christ, we have everything. And that's how we fulfill this. The sufficiency is given of God. And it all stems from, Lord, if you died for me, then I'm willing to live and die for you. And I I often think of this, you know, with regard to marriage and so on, and marriages are just falling apart right, left, and center today. They're not even being formed. (laughs) Maybe they break up before they're really put together. But, uh, you know, as a husband, I thought, now, I, I read, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an unbeliever, and I'm thinking about, well, if I'm going to get married, I need to straighten up my life, and I need, I guess I got some loyalty uh, factors in my life here. I need to think about my wife. I need to think about my children, and so on. What is the motivation for me to keep the Ten Commandments on a personal level? So I, I just don't walk in a store and I say, you know what? You can slip that in your pocket and you never have to pay for it. Uh, You know, this fella is getting uh, rave reports all over town. But you know what? I'm going to fix that. And we start the rumor and we put the lies out there and we start and people start. Oh, I thought he was a pretty good fella. I thought he was trustworthy. And here I hear these stories about him and so on and so on and so on. You know, and, and we're lying. Why would I do that? If in my stealing and in my lying, in my unfaithfulness to my wife, I would endanger our relationship, I would sacrifice the the, uh, oneness that we enjoyed at the beginning of our marriage and the example to my sons and daughters because I just felt like kicking over the traces and having a ball. What is it that keeps me online? Who in his right mind would put through put his wife through something like that? The disgrace to think I married this man. I trusted him. I thought he was loyal. I thought he was honest. I thought he was trustworthy. I thought he was reliable. And here, look what's... I would never, never do that. What keeps me? Love for my wife. And love is a commitment, not just a feeling. You make the commitment... You pray about it, you explore it, you talk about it a great deal. But once you make that commitment, you say, that's before God, that's a holy oath, and it'll never be broken. 
The only thing that breaks it is death, is death. So this is what the Apostle Paul is saying here. We have everything that we need. Satan says, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. You say what you say you can't support. Ah, yes I can, because God's grace is sufficient for me over and over. And I will do it because I love the Lord and I love those people in my own family, in my own household, in my own connective relationships. I would never do anything to break them, to lead them astray, to cause them to go down a crooked path and to their own death and their own denial of Jesus Christ. So this is what Paul is talking about, honesty. But we do not need an escape for doing what God wants us to do. It's there and it was there all the time and one day it's going to be a lame excuse if we say, Lord, I didn't have enough grace. I couldn't do it. We'll never utter those words. It'll choke up in our throats. But God is sufficient. He's sufficient. He's sufficient. And we can do what he wants us to do. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we just thank you for the wonder of your word. We thank you, Father, that as we read this book, we're dealing with real people people who can be offended, people who can take it the wrong way, people who get upset, people who are trying to defend themselves, people who just hate to forgive anybody of anything, even when they're broken and they're repentant and they desire forgiveness and we hold it back. Lord God, help us to live like Jesus wants us to live. We have no excuse because it's all there, the supply, the enablement. Bless us to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen.